People have speculated widely on the real reasons behind the U.S. invasion of Iraq, but there's a hidden motive that has not much made the news. Stephen Pelletier says he's in a position to know. As the CIA's senior political analyst on Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War, and as a professor at the Army War College from 1988 to 2000, he was privy to much of the classified material having to do with the Persian Gulf. Here's what he had to say before the war, and I quote, we're constantly reminded that Iraq has perhaps the world's largest reserves of oil, but in a regional and perhaps even geopolitical sense, it may be more important that Iraq has the most extensive river system in the Middle East. Before the first Persian Gulf War, Iraq had built an impressive system of dams and river control projects. In the 1990s, there was much discussion over the construction of a so-called peace pipeline that would bring the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers south to the parched Gulf states and by extension to Israel. No progress was made on this, largely because of Iraqi intransigence. With Iraq in American hands, of course, all this would change. That's what he said. And to complicate matters even more, Turkey is just upstream building huge dams. And that's the kind of reason that CIA analysts predict that the wars of the future, the very near future, will be fought over water, not oil. Oil tankers will soon be found carrying a far more precious cargo. This water planet may seem flush, but fresh water available for human use constitutes less than one half of one percent of all water on the planet. Worldwide, water is being used and polluted at catastrophic rates. Aquifers are plummeting. Over a billion people already lack access to clean water, and waterborne diseases are the most prevalent of all infectious diseases. Meanwhile, corporations are privatizing water, moving it from being a human right to a fee-for-service commodity in a kind of water apartheid. The word for Islamic law, sharia, literally means sharing water. That's the inescapable choice we face. There is no substitute for water, and all life depends on it. The question is, can we share it equitably and also share it with respect for the needs of the rest of the web of life? Virtually all world cultures have long associated water with the sacred oneness of life. Water, the great dissolver, teaches us that we cannot finally separate ourselves from the environment or from one another. Around the world, people are rising up to protect water, this quintessential expression of our collective heritage. In many places, communities are stopping privatization in its tracks. And there are, in fact, sustainable alternatives that will rescue us from an impending global freshwater crisis, such as those presented here this weekend by the Water Stewards Network and the Water Doctors. This is the mission of Maud Barlow, one of the world's true visionaries working for water security. Maud is among the most brilliant and eloquent leaders in the global movement to resist corporate economic globalization and the privatization of the commons. She's a key member and director of the International Forum on Globalization, the Research and Education Institute founded by the peerless Jerry Mander that has gathered many of our most penetrating political minds into perhaps the world's leading think tank on these issues and to propose real alternatives. In collaboration with the IFG, Maud and Tony Clark wrote the book Blue Gold, The Battle to Stop Corporate Theft of the World's Water, now published in 17 countries. She founded the Blue Planet Project, an international civil society movement to stop the commodification of water. She's the best-selling author of 14 books whose topics range from public policy and politics to international financial agreements. But Maud's central focus today is on conserving and equitably sharing the world's waters. At a time when the commons is becoming increasingly uncommon, Maud carries water not for corporations, but for the peoples of the world and the web of life. Like water itself, Maud is powerful enough to wear down a rock over time with relentless persistence. 
Please join me in welcoming the unsinkable Maud Barlow. Yeah. Hello, Bioneers. Wonderful, wonderful to be here. Very, very honored to be on such a, an amazing panel with these visionaries. When we think about the issue of water or the concept of water, I just want to remind us that we're living in a closed hydrologic system. And not only is the water that we use the same amount of water that was here at the creation of the planet, it's the same water. So the next time you walk in the rain, just think that some of that water falling, you, falling on you once uh, was in the blood of dinosaurs or fell from the, the, the eyes in, in the fa form of tears from children in the back of history. It's the same water. And of course, if we take care of it, it will be the same water forever and ever. But of course, we're not. Two very important uh, recent developments I want to talk to you about this morning. And most of my talk is going to be a little more political than um, what we're maybe used to at Bioneers. But we do have a political confrontation that I want to talk to you about. The first development is the fairly recent recognition of the nature of the crisis, and Kenny just described it um, very, very well. But I want to urge you, us in this room to know that the crisis is beyond just pollution, and I don't mean pollution isn't the cause of, of what we're dealing with, or just the fact that uh, so many billions of people in the world don't have access. Uh, because that's a social justice issue, but we're also talking about scarcity, and it's, it's hard to understand in a closed hydrologic system how we could actually be destroying the water table, but we are. As we destroy the surface water of the world, we are now pumping groundwater far faster than nature can replenish it. And water is being used in totally inappropriate ways to, f to fuel um, economic growth or to fuel unlimited growth, and of course that's the whole mantra of our time. Uh, and so you, you look at a country like China, it's taken its precious water resources of northern China and they're using it to divert it so that all our running shoes and shower curtain liners are, are made in China now. And whole systems are drying up. 400 of the 600 cities in northern China are now in severe water shortage. In fact, if you really think of it as kind of like um, um, uh, an apple that's drying up, but it's drying up in spots and it's just becoming wrinkled. And that's how we need to see uh, the, the situation. Now the second very important development parallel to this is that water has been discovered by the private sector long before most of us understood the extent and the nature of the crisis in, in, in which we're now living. Uh, a number of corporations around the world started uh, collecting the ways and, and thinking of the ways they were going to cartelize and commodify the world's water because those who control the world's water systems in the near future are going to be the most powerful among us. That's why I call water blue gold, both because, of course, it is precious to all of life and precious to all of us, but it has been discovered as the most important commodity to be bought and sold on the open market. Uh, and this is a, a, a parallel reality that we need to deal with as we understand and start to unravel the fact that when we exponentially remove groundwater far faster, when we mine it far faster than we can replenish it, or nature can replenish it, we know that it's going to be probably the site of many wars in the future. Now, we live in an era, the era of the so-called Washington Consensus, that governments are abandoning their responsibility to their citizens, to natural resources, in the name of competition and unlimited growth. And as uh, one famous environmental, environmentalist said, that uh, unlimited growth has the same DNA as the cancer cell. It has to turn on its host in order to survive. But that's a, a system and a, and a kind of thinking that all, most of our governments around the world have bought into big time. In this new world, absolutely everything is for sale. The seed deep in the forest, the rain before it falls, the fish in the, in the water before they're caught. Absolutely everything has been commodified. And so the, the new mantra around water is commodify it, put it on the open market for, for sale, and let it be bought by the highest bidder. And what is a dispute now is whether water is a fundamental human right or a human need. And you may think that's semantic, but it's not. The World Bank says that it's a, it's a human need, and therefore it can be delivered by corporations. We say it's a fundamental human right, and you cannot buy and trade or give away a human right. Now, I, 
A handful of very powerful corporations have moved into the area of water, and I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about what kinds of corporations we're talking about and what types of privatization. There are three basic ways in which water is being commodified. The first is bottled water. We are putting a great deal of fresh water around the world in plastic bottles every year. Last year it was over 100 billion liters. I think that's about 33, 35 billion gallons of water, in pla mostly in plastic, non-recyclable bottles. Uh, and we now have places like the Philippines that are receiving these as, as one of their growing industries in mountain, huge towering mountains of plastic bottles. Uh, there, is, there are fierce fights being waged all over the world as these corporations come in either to take municipal water, which is what Pepsi and Coke do, and they put it through a process whereby they discard two-thirds. For every liter of water, they discard two-thirds. Um, or um, companies like Nestle, which owns about 78 brands, including Perrier, and there are fights even uh, here in North America around these companies. They're coming in and taking ancient aquifer water, and Coca-Cola just got the contract, a um, hundred year right to a whole water system in the state of Kerala, India. And they're telling the local people that they have no right to access that water. And this is the, I know it sounds insane, but you get to go into countries that are very, very poor and who, whose governments are, or municipalities are desperate for money, and these, they turn around and these companies are here. And let us just say this out loud, it is a form of mass insanity to allow so much water to be put in plastic bottles that destroy our environment as we allow our public water systems to decline. The second area of concern around privatization is the bulk export of water by pipeline, diversion, or tanker. Now this is just in its infancy, but um, uh, it's already started. Libya has already built a huge pipeline to take the, rema the, the remaining water out of the only aquifer under the desert, an aquifer that's supposed to be shared by five countries, and they're just, uh, they've just taken it by force through building this pipeline. There are pipelines being seriously negotiated and, and discussed by these corporations in, from Scotland to England, from the Alps in Europe to other parts of the thirstier parts of Europe. Uh, Bolivia, one of the reasons that there's a civil war in Bolivia right now is that the government is not only going to send gas to uh, North America, but they're also, they've agreed to sell uh, bulk water to Chile because the mining industry there um, needs the more fresh water. And like many mining industries around the world, it's a terrible polluter. Um, and of course, we in Canada are a tad nervous about the fact that you're running out of water in, in California and <laughs> the Midwest, and we, we have very, very big reasons to have concerns about the water waste in places like Las Vegas, because we figure, and so does your president, that when you need it uh, in the United States, you'll come calling for it. And I want to make a very clear statement here. This isn't about not sharing resources. This is about being able to make determinations about water use, ecological use, in a way that's environmentally sound and is based on need, not on the, uh, on the fact that some are going to get a hold of this and sell it to those who can afford it. The third area of privatization, and the one that's most um, moving most fast, is the whole privatization of the delivery of fresh water in municipalities and communities around the world. This is happening very fast. There are three major corporations. Enron got into the game, by the way, but was, this is one of the one of the good byproducts of Enron going down. As Azurix went down as well. But the three big players, Suez, Vivendi and RWE Thames are all European, and they are on a very, very aggressive move to cartelize the world's water sources, and they actually work with each other to say, I'll stay out of this area, but you give me this area, and they are actually dividing up the world very clearly. All three of these corporations are in the Fortune 100 top transnational corporations, Globally, their annual revenue last year was $160 billion. It's growing at 10% a year, outpacing the economy of many countries in which they operate, and they also employ more staff than most governments. Vivendi now has 300,000, this is Vivendi, uh, their, the, just their water division, not their entertainment division, uh, employs 300,000 people around the world. Their takeover of water systems around the world is absolutely well documented, and I invite you to join us in 
spreading this word, and I can share this with you through our website and so on, but it's huge profits, higher prices for water, cutoffs to people who can't pay. In many third world countries, they've actually taken the, the, the water and, and, and put it right out of the reach of, of sometimes the majority of the population. In Bolivia, when they privatized water, they actually said, we're also going to charge you for the rain that falls on cisterns in your wells and your roof. I do not make that up. You couldn't. Totally secret dealings, reduced water standards, and bribery and corruption. Now, it will not surprise you to know that then there is, of course, an set of institutional players that have come around to promote uh, the privatization of the world's water. These companies are aggressively backed by the World Bank, the other uh, development banks, and the International Monetary Fund. The majority of loans, in fact, in the last five years by the World Bank on water have been on condition that they privatize. And, but so contentious and outright hated are these companies. In community after community around the world, they are being kicked out. The local resistance is so fierce. From Manila, from Manila in the Philippines, to Buenos Aires, to Atlanta, Georgia. Did you know that Atlanta just uh, ended a 20-year contract after two years with Suez because for one, from one of many reasons, the water coming out of the taps was brown. Because there's this fight back, the World Bank has just announced that it's going to increase its funding for these corporations. And don't forget, this is public money. This is our money. They're going to increase the funding for privatization of water in the third world from $1.3 billion this year to $4 billion next year. There is a World Water Council that set itself up as a global high command of water, and they treat themselves and talk about themselves as if they're the kind of the United Nations of water, but in fact it's the World Bank, the IMF, and these big water companies. And they have established a World uh, Water Forum every three years, which just took place in Kyoto, Japan. And let me tell you, we brought hundreds of people from all over the world, and we we caused them such distress at every single <laughs> workshop, every panel. There was a panel of CEOs with all the heads of all the water companies sitting up on this dais with, these, with their you know, $4,000 Brioni suits. And we had one after the other, our people from the Global South come up and, sh and hold up bottles of water, what water looks like in their communities after it's been privatized, and sent it up to the presidents of these companies and challenged them, are you brave enough to drink this? And of course, the suits at the front were holding the bottles out like this. It, we caused major trouble. We, were, we got 90% of the media, and we actually forced the World Water Council to put on their website that, alas, there had been no consensus on water privatization at the World Water Forum. But water is also in trade agreements, and I want to urge us to remember to fight, continue to fight these terrible trade agreements. Water is both a good in NAFTA and the World Trade Organization, which means that you cannot put a limit on the import or export of this good. It is an investment in NAFTA, and if they succeed in extending NAFTA to the, to the other countries of the Americas, it will be a, an investment in uh, all of the countries of the Americas, Canada is being sued for $10 billion by a little fly-by-night California company because British Columbia banned the export of, of fresh water for commercial sale. And this company under NAFTA is suing Canada, and we think they've made a quiet deal because suddenly the company's gone very quiet, and they don't have to publish this. This would be the model for the world if investment is placed uh, in the WTO, which um, they're also trying to do. now both under the WTO, under the GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, and through the FTAA, they want water also to be a service. And guess who's taken the lead on this? The European Union, who's taken a good stand on uh, genetically engineered foods, but a terrible stand on water because it stands to benefit their three countries. So let me tell you about a success that you may or may not have read about, what happened at King Cancun just a month ago when the World Trade Organization met. Now, this issue wasn't so much around water per se, but it was around the right of livelihood of farmers around the world. And on the very first day 
of the WTO, and you got to picture Cancun as, I mean, 37, 38 years ago it didn't exist. It was, I mean, it existed. It was an absolutely gorgeous, um, natural uh, wonder of the world, and they thought, this is great, let's make money from it, and they've built these hideous, awful uh, hotels. Some of them have nine and ten restaurants in one hotel, and, you know, the pools on every level and so on. And then there's a, a city of 700,000 uh, Mexicans who basically look after them. Well, they barricaded that off so that the, the, the delegates from around the world could uh, live in their five-star hotels and have their meetings undisturbed by the world's opinion. And they put up a barricade, and on the first day, 10,000 campesinos, uh, uh, displaced farmers from around the world, marched towards the barricade and, and took the barricade, pulled it down. <laughs> And a farmer, a farm leader from South Korea, there were about 200 fabulous South Koreans there, they were absolutely wonderful people. A farm leader named uh, Lee Kyung Hai climbed up on the barricade and turned to face the dub where the WTO was meeting, miles away of course. Mr. Lee was wearing a great big sign that said WTO kills farmers. And nobody knew he was going to do this. He pulled his sign up and he took a knife and he stabbed himself in the heart. And he swayed back, and we all watched. He swayed back and forth on the barricade, and he fell, and he died. And no one knew he was going to do this, not his family, no one from the South Korean uh, group. They were absolutely devastated. And he did this. He left information that, pe that came out later about why he did this, and he said, my family farmed in rice paddies from time immemorial, this farm was passed down. This was communal land. We took care of the water. We took care of the, the land. And they, under the World Trade Organization's agricultural agreement, we ended up having food dumped in here, and my land is now a, par a shopping mall. They built a big tourist area because apparently it's very beautiful, and he's attended too many farmer suicides. There have been thousands of farmer suicides in, in uh, India where, where people are fighting the, the twin issues of land and water. Uh, and the way they choose to kill themselves is that they eat the, the Monsanto's Roundup Ready as a symbol. They kill themselves with, with, the, with the pesticide instead of killing their land or their water. And Mr. Lee did this. His daughter was getting married the next week. That's how little they knew he was going to do this. He did this. He was a farm leader. He was not... A nut. He was somebody who said, I don't know how else to say to the world, this is about life and death. It's about the survival of the planet, and I have nothing else to give. You got my farm. You took my friends. I've got nothing else to give except my life. And it became the symbol around which we organized all week. And I have to tell you that on the last march, we actually had an agreement with the authorities to allow us to take down the fence. The women went in first. Local indigenous women cut the first wires. There were 20,000 riot police, and they came up to that fence, and they cut, looking at the police, I was closer than I am to the people in the front here, and they stood, and, they, and we pulled it down, and then the last barrier was pulled down by the South Koreans. This had all been agreed on, and then we sat down. There was not one piece of violence. Every thousands and thousands of us sat in the grass. and we put down thousands of white carnations for Mr. Lee. And the next day, the third world stood up to the, what's called the Quad, which is the United States, Canada, Europe, and Japan, and said, no. Well, you can't have all our resources, you can't have all the forests, you can't have all the trees, you can't have all the fish, you can't have all the water, you can't continue to impoverish our people. We have found ourselves, we are a roaring new voice, and we will not we will not be put in this position again. A seismic change took place in world politics last month, and I'll bet you didn't read it very much in any of your local newspapers, because you know what? They don't want us to know that their system is failing. And that, when Kenny talked about those, those three stages, uh, and, the, and the last being, you know, that, or one of the stages being fierce resistance. They're fiercely resisting us now. We're not cute anymore. We're a movement whose time has come and they know it and they're frightened. Water. We're on the cusp of making some very important decisions around water. More, faster than most of us realize, water is becoming a cartel to be controlled by a powerful global elite. 
Unless we are successful in stopping this juggernaut in the not too distant future, water will be a commodity and all decisions regarding water will be made on commercial, not environmental or uh, social justice considerations. Now this is not to excuse the way in which some governments have, have delivered water. We have not collectively cared for our water. But the answer to not good government or not adequate government is good government and answering to the people and answering to an awakened population. It is not handing it over to transnational corporations who will continue to promote the corrupt governments that uh, got them there in the first place. What we have to say in answer to the question who owns water is that no one owns it. It belongs to the earth, it belongs to other species, it belongs to future generations, it is a fundamental human right, it is a public trust, it is part of the global commons that we're going to carve out of these marketplace mechanisms and is going to be one of the, the first places in which we reject the Washington Consensus. And a water secure future is based on the twin principles, the twin foundations of conservation on one hand and social justice or equity on the other. Cannot have one without the other. We're going to have to build a movement where environmental concerns come together with human justice concerns and we say to one another that we, every human in the world, every plant in the world, every other species in the world has the same right to this fund fundamental right to water. And when I remember standing in a place called Orange Farm in, in South Africa and seeing when the, for the first time water being piped to houses that have never had it and that have pit latrines outside and the, the worst poverty I have seen in my life. But finally, because they have water as a guaranteed constitutional right, there it is coming up to them. Uh, but there's between the water and the tap is a state-of-the-art water meter put in by their government and Suez. And they cannot afford it. And now they have to still walk miles to get the water from rivers that are polluted with cholera warning signs. I say no. You know who we're working with? We're working with the South African Municipal Workers Union, who are the ones who have to put the meters in in the daytime and come back and teach people how to take them out at night. That's who we're working with. Water is the sacred lifeblood of the earth. No one has the right to take it for profit. Until we collectively understand that, expect more resistance, expect violence, and I don't mean from our side, there are going to be, there's going to be police repression around this. Expect the resistance to get stronger, expect it to get global. Expect the rise of a powerful civil society movement to challenge the lords of water. No one gave them the world's water. People and nature will take it back. Thank you.